Hi, everyone. Welcome to Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. We're going to talk about diagnostics today, how an eye scan could potentially diagnose early signs of cognitive impairment or an early stage of Alzheimer's disease. And I'm excited to have with us Peter Van Weingarten. He's from the Center of Eye Research Australia, joining us from Melbourne right now. Peter, thanks for joining us and welcome. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So we um, have a lot of, uh, lately, there's a lot more um, research looking for easier ways to diagnose um, Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment. Tell us a little bit about um, what you are working on and how it works. So we have been working for a few years looking at the retina, the neural tissue at the back of the eye, and whether that can provide us with clues to Alzheimer's disease. And the reason that we've pursued that is that the retina, the tissue at the back of the eye, is something that we as eye doctors look at every day. Um, and what we know from, from history is that that tissue is a developmental extension of the brain. So we can image brain without having to look through a thick bony layer. Um, and so there are opportunities to detect signs of brain disease early. So we have heard, I mean, I, you know, there, there are tests for people who um, suffer from brain tumors that they, you know, sometimes they're diagnosed through an optician looking through their eyes. Is it, can we compare it to that? Is it similar in terms of um, that type of early diagnosis? Well, to an extent, that's a change in the nerve at the back of the eye, which shows raised pressure around the brain. In Alzheimer's disease, we're interested to see whether in the retinal tissue, there are similar changes occurring. And we know from studies of, um, of tissue samples that some of the changes that occur in the brain also occur in the retina. So the accumulation of abnormal proteins like amyloid beta um, and the loss of neural tissue. So we have at our um, disposal really advanced imaging technologies, even in standard eye care, that show us um, measures of that nerve tissue loss and a lot of studies have been published looking at, at nerve tissue loss in the back of the eye and associating that with Alzheimer's disease. One of the potential limitations of that approach is that it's not specific to Alzheimer's disease. So we really sought over the last few years to see whether we could find signals that are very specific to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, you're not the first, if I'm, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you're not the first um, group to look to the eyes for early detection, but how is what you're developing different from what's out there or what's um, you know, being studied currently? So I guess we, we like all scientists, stand on the shoulders of, of, our, you know, of the people that have come before us. Um, and we were very fortunate to um, take advantage of, of two major innovations. The first was developed by scientists at NASA for satellite imaging of the Earth. Um, they developed in the late 70s a, a technology known as hyperspectral imaging, where they um, imaged an object, in this case the Earth and space, with different colours of light. And what they find is that when you image with different colours of light, you get a very rich um, information about what you're imaging that speaks to its structure. And it turns out that a lot of prospecting of the earth for minerals is done this way. It's used extensively in industry. And so we wondered whether we could apply that technology in the eye to see whether we could see amyloid beta in the retina. So that was, that was one foundational technology. Um, a group of scientists at, at the University of Minnesota had um, applied this technology using a microscope on tissue samples from individuals with confirmed Alzheimer's disease, looking at brain tissue and at retinal tissue. And they found that there was a distinctive um, signal that they could see in people with Alzheimer's disease that was not present in people without. Um, and so we sought to apply that technology um, in vivo in, in people. So simply put, you're taking a NASA grade um, camera basically in order to scan the back of the eye where the retina is and you can actually visibly detect plaques um, potentially at an earlier stage before people are in full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so the, the work that we've done, that's, that's a great summary. The work that we've done today shows that we can, um, through a simple image of the back of the eye, instead of like a, a white light flash that you might have when you have a photograph taken with your optician uh, or your ophthalmologist, um, you get a rainbow coloured flash. And we then can analyse those data using um, special computer um, machine learning approaches to detect a, a signal for that's specific for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a pretty simplistic question, but I don't know the answer to this. But how, like, how do the plaques make it to the back of our eyes? Like, do we know? We do. Do we know? I mean, we know the presence of beta amyloid plaque is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. But do we know exactly where it is in the body? I mean, we know we can detect it through a PET stick and and also a cerebral um, spinal fluid. Um, um, uh, uh, lumbar puncture, um, yeah. but what do we know about its presence um, in in the eye? I think it's been an evolving um, an evolving knowledge base. So up until quite recently, there was a lot of contention as to whether or not amyloid beta is accumulating in retina, and that's because a lot of the early studies looked at very um, um, looked quite cursorily at the retina. Some really great work has been done. Um, showing that it's there, it's in it's in smaller quantities than it is in the brain, um, and and essentially it's a it's a byproduct of processing of a larger essential protein that's required in many cells in the body, and so we find small traces of amyloid beta throughout the body. Um, the retina is neural tissue, and so its accumulation has been associated in in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease to closely correspond with accumulation in the brain. So I guess what I'm wondering is how early, I mean, I before this interview, I was telling you that, you know, I, I sometimes think, oh, gosh, do I really want to know um, if I'm eventually going to end up with Alzheimer's disease with, you know, uh, being a daughter who has a mom with Alzheimer's, how early would I really want to know? And what, how could this technology help someone like me? It's a, that's a very difficult and, and a very personal question um, for everyone who's, who's in that um, situation. It's the question that we are currently trying to answer from a scientific perspective is when does that retinal signal become positive? And we've been very fortunate to have funding from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation um, to start exploring that question. So we know at the moment that our tests can distinguish people um, with mild cognitive impairment, those who are PET positive, um, who've had the brain scan, PET positive for amyloid beta from those individuals who are PET negative. Um, and so we think it's useful at that very early stage of the disease, but we know that amyloid accumulates over up to 20 years before that point. So the, um, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Fund um, is supporting us to look at a screening study um, and we are taking cognitively normal middle-aged people who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease because they have a family history of, of Alzheimer's disease and we're following them um, and comparing our retinal scan to lumbar puncture, so the cerebrospinal fluid tests and brain imaging. And that's through a really, really um, fantastic collaboration we have with an Australian study called the Healthy Brain Project. So this would enable us to understand um, earlier, and I understand why that's important for research, if we could diagnose people who are higher at risk, who you know, may not be um, displaying signs of Alzheimer's disease, but yet they're traveling down that road. But I guess I'm asking myself, is it possible to see um, signs of plaques in the retina, but not actually end up with Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, if you li live a, li a full lifespan? Do we know the answer to that yet? We, we don't. We know from PET imaging studies that there are some people, and it is a minority of people who, who might be positive on the PET scan for amyloid beta that may never go on to get Alzheimer's disease. And I guess the way that we are thinking about this at the moment is, is as one of probably a constellation of risk factors that contribute to, to prediction of whether someone's on a trajectory. And we're hoping that we'll, um, through this study, we'll, we'll get a better understanding of, of what it means to be positive on our test. 
Um, we're getting questions in. One one viewer asking, is this available in the US? I mean, obviously it's not available yet. It's still under study. Um, that's the point of the funding um, from the Alzheimer's Disco Discovery Drug Foundation. But tell us where you are in the research and how long is it gonna take before we know the answer to this? Um, and really um, it's available in in doctor's offices as a as a routine scan. Um, so because it's non-invasive, we hope that it, that, that it shouldn't be too hard to get this to the clinic. Um, at the moment, we have um, strong evidence that we can distinguish those people at, at the early stage of memory impairment in Alzheimer's disease, those who have amyloid in the brain from those who do not. Um, we still do not know how early in the disease trajectory it becomes positive. We will um, have a two-year study with funding from the ADDF um, to look cross-sectionally at those individuals at high, higher risk um, of Alzheimer's disease to see whether our test at baseline corresponds with their cerebrospinal fluid findings. So we'll have some idea um, at that point. In order to know how predictive that is of long-term outcomes, we'll need to follow those individuals in the long term. So I suspect that one of the first ways that this technology might come to the clinic is to help for people presenting with memory impairment to help identify whether they may need to go on to a PET scan. So we're talking probably at least a couple years or so. Is there is there a way to put a time frame on it? I think um, the, the regulatory environment around um, diagnostic and biomarker tests is always quite stringent. So it's probably closer to two to five years. Right. So, um, I under, tell us a little bit about what this would mean for research though. If you're able to identify those candidates early on before they're exhibiting symptoms of Alzheimer's, what does that mean for research? I think it means a number of things. Most importantly, it means that we can streamline the identification of people who might be suitable for inclusion in trials of new disease modifying therapies. At the moment, to identify people using lumbar puncture or PET scan for these trials um, well before the onset of memory impairment cost drug companies a tremendous amount, up to $40 million to identify the very people that need to be included in the studies. So if we can streamline that, that would be a major innovation and we hope that it would feel more interest and investment from drug companies to, in, in the field of disease modifying therapies. From a um, understanding of the disease process, we'll be able to track individuals over time uh, our tests can be repeated daily if you want to. Um, it's completely non-invasive and safe. And so you could actually plot tra trajectories of the biomarker um, and map that against other changes. T tell us a little bit about the specifics of the test. So is it just much like going to the optometrist? You're put in a seat, you wear these funny glasses and they look in your eye. Is it just like that? So at the moment, it's very similar. So at the moment, we um, dilate the pupils, so you get a drop to make the um, the pupils large, and we image, um, and it's it's almost exactly the same as a standard photograph, um, but instead of that single bright white light flash, there's a rainbow coloured flash as we sweep across 90 different colours of light. Um, and that takes less than a second per image, we acquire a few images, and then um, that gets processed um, and we have a result very quickly. So on the, the, the preliminary research that you've conducted, what, ha what have been the results? And I'm assuming these are humans you've, you've run the tests on since they're non-invasive? Yes, we've done it both in humans and in Alzheimer's disease model mice. Um, and so um, we have, um, through the great fortune of a collaboration with the Australian Imaging um, Biomarker Study of Aging, a landmark Alzheimer's study, recruited um, people who have had PET scans. Um, we've imaged them on our camera and then been able to um, separate them out using, using this approach. Um, and we've validated that um, through our collaborators in Canada who provided us in a masked fashion PET scan results and retinal imaging results and we've been able to separate those individuals out as well. We've also so done it in Sorry, go did, ahead. did the results correspond with the PET scan? So every time there was the presence of plaques in a, in a PET scan, was, was it present in the eye scan as well? So with a sensitivity and specificity of about 90%. 90%. 
that's quite high. Yeah. So at the moment, our um, participant numbers are, are reasonably small. We're in, engaging in a larger confirmatory study. Um, so at the moment, we, we can use this to classify individuals as likely pet positive, likely pet negative. Um, and we're now looking to see whether we can actually uh, accurately assess the amount of amyloid in the brain on the basis of the retina scan, but more work needs to be done there. So, um, so this new the, the new money for the Alzheimer from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation will enable you to do a, a larger study. How many people are going to be in that study? So we have funding for um, the screening study for three hundred participants over the next two years. Over the next three years. Three, two years, yes. Two years, okay. So, okay, and then, but, but I guess what people are wondering who are listening to this is like, but then then what? Like, is do you have to like comb through the regulatory process? Like, does this need FDA approval? Like how how hard is it to get these into doctor's offices so that people are, patients are actually using them? Yeah, so the, the regulatory environment is of course very strict and, and that's for good reason to, to as a safeguard for, for our patients. Um, the technology that we're using in and of itself is, is very safe. It's essentially the same as a standard retinal camera, just using different colors of light. Where this is of regulatory significance is what we're actually claiming on the basis of what we find. So for this technology to reach the clinic for general use without a disease associated claim, I think there's a very low um, barrier for that. But I think the evidence needs to be really robust that, that these preliminary findings are actually confirmed uh, on a large, larger sample, people from different um, ethnicities, different backgrounds, different genders, to make sure that this is a, a valid and robust biomarker. Uh, and that's okay. what we're committing yeah, sorry. to. Sorry. So we, we talk about this in terms of diagnostics. What about people who have already been diagnosed, like for example, with early onset Alzheimer's? Will this do anything for them um, in terms of understanding, I mean, you know, some people have been diagnosed and never had a PET scan unless they participated in a trial, obviously, because it um, is so expensive and not covered by insurance. So what about people who have already have diagnosis? Does an eye scan help them in any way? Um, we, we don't know the answer to that question. I would think probably not. Um, it may be possible to, to monitor people over time to sort of monitor um, progression and, and to get an idea of what the trajectory of the disease is. Um, but we don't know the answer, whether we have the answer to that question yet. We've not looked. And, and so far we've only talked about beta amyloid plaque. What about tau tangles? Um, is there is it possible to, to see tangles in an eye scan? So we, um, we know from some recent re really good studies, both in the States and, and in the Netherlands, that tau and phospho tau are in retina as well. What we get is a, uh, a particular pattern of reflection of light from the retina. Um, and it's possible that that contains within it um, a signal for tau. At the moment, the only way we've been able to associate our signal with amyloid beta is, is by comparing with amyloid beta levels in the brain. Um, tau pet imaging is now coming to the fore and we are um, seeking to compare our retinal finding with um, tau pet imaging. Um, the Healthy Brain Project study where we're comparing our retinal findings against the um, spinal fluid findings will also help to answer that question. It's likely that there is a, a component of our signal that, that speaks to tau. So we're getting some comments. Um, one first is, what is the criteria? How do people get into this study? I mean, presumably right now it's only in Australia. Is that right? Yes, at the moment, the, the Healthy Brain Project study is, is in Australia. Um, and that's a, a population-based sample, so anyone can sign up to the study online. Um, and, and I believe that participants can participate abroad from, from overseas in the online component of the study. It's looking at risk factors, um, cognition, um, lifestyle behaviours, um, and, and plotting that and to determine modifiable risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's disease. But the participants in our study have enrolled in an intensive biomarker sub-study. So they are having more detailed neuropsychological tests, they're having an MRI, and they're having lumbar puncture and our, our retinal imaging. Are you working with any um, institutions in the US or is it uh, primarily just in Australia for this stage of it? 
at the moment, just in Australia, we are on the cusp of publishing our paper and we would love to collaborate with other institutes um, abroad. How expensive is the, the equipment? Is it is I mean, are the cameras affordable to doctors clinics? So at the moment, we are working with a, um, a research grade camera, which is quite costly um, and would probably be quite hard to scale out into um, into clinics more broadly. Um, we have shown that we can um, use only a few colours of light to detect the same signal. And that's a major innovation that we're progressing now. I have a, a group of engineers developing low cost cameras. We're actually 3D printing low cost cameras with a view to, to bringing a simpler um, version of the technology to the clinic. And one of the problems with PET scans, of course, is they're so darn expensive and not covered by insurance. So I'm just wondering if an eye scan for the same reason um, as a PET that gives you a similar result, with, with that, is insurance going to be another factor? So we would see this type of technology being available in um, primary eye care practices because we can um, show all of the functionality of a normal uh, retinal camera, but with additional biomarker detection. And so vision is that you might go to your optometrist one day to have a retinal check and find out risk, if you wish, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. We're still a way away from that. That's the vision. Um, but it is possible that that's how this technology is deployed. There are well, already, um, rebates available in other disease contexts for retinal photography and um, interpretation of those photographs. So for the diabetic eye disease. So it might be a similar model. Right. Well, Peter, well, thank you so much for your time and sharing with us this really interesting um, diagnostic tool. Um, we wish you all the luck. I think it would really um, help research so much to identify potential uh, people who may be headed down um, the, the road to Alzheimer's, but getting them in an earlier stage um, would be enormously helpful to research. Um, and in terms of diagnostics, you know, to give people that option instead of that expensive PET scan um, would be really transformational. So thank you for your time. Um, please let us um, keep us posted on the research. I know there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, if we've missed anything, of course, we'll send them on and you can always watch these interviews on beingpatient.com. Um, we believe direct access to the research is essential in moving the needle and finding a cure um, to this disease. So thank you very much for your time and please do keep us posted. Thanks, Deborah. And um, I want to say thank you to all the patients that have participated in our research and also to our generous funders, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Fund and the Yugal Bar Alzheimer's Research Program. Do you have a website people can go to to stay abreast of, of the information that's coming out from your research? So the Centre for Eye Research Australia often has updates on our progress and the Healthy Brain Project has a, a website as well. Okay, we'll link to those um, on um, our page. So thank you very much. Thanks for your time and good luck with your research. Thank you very much, Deborah.